afternoon. Good afternoon. It is afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, firstly, thanks to um, I'm just going to start my watch. Thanks to Lorna and Rob for the session. It's been really, really interesting so far. So I hope I'm going to bring something to the table here. Um, I was aware I might have seemed slightly grumpy earlier with some of my comments, um, and what I'm going to talk about that now may um, may kind of give you. Uh, some background to kind of some of my grumpiness it causes for kind of a uh, concern and depression in certain areas of, um, of, of archaeology in Ireland. Um, so yeah, uh, turf wars. I'm sorry if you can't have a title and a kind of thing like that, a tag. Where, where can you have it? So um, uh, so yeah, that's that's me. Um, I'm based at, at UCC in Ireland, as you may have picked up earlier. I've been there for four years now, having escaped from um, escaped from uh, University of Birmingham. Anyway, so. Um, Kind of what I'm going to talk about today really is, is, um, is uh, the practice of peatland archaeology in Ireland over the last kind of 20 years, I suppose, and particularly within the, uh, the mitigation sector associated with the industrial, for it is industrial, exploitation of Irish peatland. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've talked about this a, a few times this year. I don't know if anyone was at the Warp Conference. I don't think so. Um, this can end up as a rant and it can end up being defamatory so I have to kind of watch my language conscious um, and this is being streamed um, so you may have to read between the lines with some of this um, and that's maybe something we can come back to okay so just very quickly some there's a, a, quite a few acronyms potentially here so I'm going to kind of outline what these are first so we've got ADS uh, archaeological contractors for Borden and Mona, down here Borden and Mona, the, the state owned peat cutting company in Ireland who are charged with exploiting uh, the peat resource of Ireland mainly for this is for, for domestic energy uh, requirement. We've got the Departments of Art, Heritage, Regional Rural Affairs and the Gwail Tat, which is the government department that uh, amongst other things, according to their words, promotes and protects Ireland's heritage and culture. Board and managers mentioned we have the Irish Archaeological Wetland Unit, maybe familiar to some of you, the, the late great Barry Rafteries. Uh, outfit who were contractors for Borden Manor between 1990 and 2005. We have the Irish Turf Cutters Association, and they're really very pleasant people. If you go and look on some of their Facebook sites, some of the discussions about peatland conservation and peatland archaeology. Um, yeah, that's something I'll come back to later. And finally, we have the National Monument Service. So they're essentially the regulatory body who advise uh, this crowd up here, the AHRRG, in terms of a kind of most matter to do with the regulation and protection of. Ireland's heritage. So there's all the acronyms. So do try and keep up. So obviously peat's turf, do you get it now? But so so uh, peat in Ireland is known as turf, so turf cutting. And as I just uh, alluded to, uh, mostly peat in Ireland is used for domestic energy supplies. So we have the industrial exploitation of the Midland bogs, but we also have, also have private peat cutting in Turbury. I'm going to come back to that shortly. Um, so yeah, peat bogs. What are peat bogs? Again, this is an ecology lecture, so I'm not going to go into any great depth here. Obviously, accumulations of organic matter in wet places. Um, and again, this clearly isn't an ecological lecture. Um, if archaeology is political, peatlands are increasingly political. Some of you may be familiar with this. Not least, for a number of reasons, to do with biodiversity and Annex 1 habitat under the uh, EU Habitats Directive. Also, increasingly on the agenda in terms of climate change. Uh, a huge carbon pool, as you can see there. Um, also, a carbon sink when they're, when they're functioning and not being drained or cut, um, but also a contributor to, uh, to anthropogenic uh, emissions when they're um, basically drained and drying out. So, uh, so there have been various developments on this front, not least uh, within the context of Kyoto. So re-wetting of peatlands and wetlands, wetland restoration is now uh, operates under certain um, requirements of Kyoto to do with member states, signatories, uh, contributions towards mitigation of climate change. So there you go, that's kind of the, the other aspect of Peatons there. So again, to return to the Irish situation, I mean, it's kind of maybe the, the, the image, the popular image of peat extraction in Ireland, and certainly private turbary um, of this, this, this kind is, is, is important. Um, and again, this is, this is kind of moving, as you'll see in a, shortly, and there's a good quote here, the seasonal turf harvest and in more recent times the mechanical conquest of the peatlands has, have woven the bogs into the Irish side. Okay, so we've got this kind of aspect of peat cutting being very strongly associated with uh, cultural heritage in Ireland. Okay, so we'll see in a minute and this is a massive clash when it comes to archaeology. So lots of peatlands in Ireland, about probably just under 20% of the land area of Ireland is bog of, of one form or another. 
And these are the Bordner Mona bogs. So these are mainly the Midland bogs that are exploited by Bordner Mona. Okay, so this is, this is what we're talking about now. It's industrial peat extraction on, on that scale. If you've ever been kind of through the Midlands of Ireland, you've seen these kind of enormous, like, drained landscapes that are being kind of harrowed and cut like this. So this is about, eight, I think it's about 80 to 90,000 hectares of bog land. So a lot. And again, I mean, really just an excuse to show some lovely archaeology. Uh, Irish bogs uh, are absolutely stuffed with archaeology. Um, some of you may be familiar with this site, probably one of the better known sites from the Irish peatlands. This is Corley 1, the Iron Age trackway. Again, some more sites from Raftery's excavations of Corley. This is Corley 6 and 9, Neolithic with a Bronze Age site over it. Bog bodies, you know, we could spend the rest of the day showing these pictures of beautiful organic archaeology. And of course, the other thing is the value of peatlands is the Paleo Environmental Archive, um, not least for pollen analysis, paleoclimate work, big importance in terms of uh, the, 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 the peat resource. Okay, so the reason we know there's all these sites in Irish peatlands is should be fairly obvious, that's because um, so much of the peat is being extracted, the archaeology otherwise would be sat very, ha uh, very happily within the peat. Um, and very recently, well, three years ago recently now, <laughs> we now have a handle on actually how many sites there are in Irish bogs, and this is again referring to the Borden Mona peatlands. Um, so this is a review I was, I was involved with that was commissioned by the National Monument Service, so essentially reviewing 20 years of uh, peat extraction in Ireland. And again, the, kind of the detail is, I, I'm kind of going into this too, in too much detail, um, but we now know, again in the extracted peatlands of Ireland, there's just under 4,000 archaeological sites. Okay? So there's two aspects, or there the, the were two aspects of the archaeological mitigation. One is survey, to identify sites, then limited programme of excavation. So if you just look very quickly at this graph here, you'll see, for example, this shows you uh, hectares of peatland that have been field walked. Okay, so this goes up after 2000, you can see it going up there. Um, this is numbers of sites found, which completely fall off a cliff uh, after kind of 2000, 2001. Or you can express it in another way. The wetland unit uh, walked or surveyed around 30,000 hectares, found about 3,800 archaeological sites. ADS uh, surveyed 34,000 hectares, and identified 500 sites. Okay, interesting pattern. And again, there's various things we can do with this data that I'm not going to go into, but we can break it down in terms of, of, of sites and finds. So we have maybe these kind of these kind of uh, trackway sites, uh, kind of single plank trackways. We have this category that's not massively useful. It's referred to as archaeological wood, which can range from one pointy stick like that to a pointy stick pointing out of a peak face, which may be the end, for example, of a linear uh, structure. So the main point here is, you know, we, we have at least some good metrics on the sites we have in Irish peatlands. And again, I, I don't want to go into this in too much detail. I'm conscious, kind of, a, um, you know, we're going to go to lunch soon, and everyone probably wants, everyone's probably hungry. But just to pull this out, um, less than nine percent of those four thousand sites have been excavated as part of this program of mitigation. Okay, um, the level of resolution of that excavation varies very heavily. So around about 27% have been excavated in full. Um, you, you can see the figures for yourself, I'm not going to walk you through them. 27% um, unknown resolution, we can establish that. Other issues to do with chronology, uh, very uneven in terms of, in terms of the, the record in the archive. We couldn't, for example, establish the state of uh, over 130 sites in terms of whether the, they had radiocarbon dates. The important point here as well is site status, and this is the site status of almost all these sites, 55% um, of these are being uh, destroyed or in the process of being destroyed. 40% are in imminent danger or threatened. So to put it in another way, almost all of those sites, other than a, a couple, one in Ballybeg, a remarkable complex, and the other one in Clonfinloch, may be familiar to some of your late Bronze Age of wetland settlement, which are in currently in what's called permanent set aside, i.e. in theory being preserved in situ. Um, that's debatable in many ways. Almost all of those 4,000 sites will be destroyed and will end up in a power station being burned. Okay. Eventually. 2030 at the moment is the, is the estimated date for the end of uh, peat extraction on board the moment's peat. They say 2030 and it's kind of framed as, oh, by 2030 we'll have a transition to other forms of energy. The point being, by 2030 the bogs will be tapped out, so there'll be no peat left to extract anyway. Okay. So where does this leave us? Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's kind of industrial scale extraction. Then we have private turf cutting, private turbary rights. Now these are a long-held historical rights to cut turf privately. Okay, 
this is in many ways and has been highly contentious and difficult in Ireland because there's been a huge clash with the EU over special areas of conservation, that's bogs that are meant to be protected by the Irish government, which aren't. Why is that? Because they're being cut by private peat extractors. Okay, and this is, um, this is uh, Luke Ming Flanagan, he's an MEP, he's extremely outspoken when it comes to the rights of, of turf cutters. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's move on from that. And again, this is kind of come back to something we were talking about in the uh, session on uh, day uh, one of the conference. Uh, there's a very strong association with, with peat, peat extraction, um, and uh, kind of Irish heritage. This is a bit of Seamus Heaney, you may be familiar with the poem. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Tones for. Okay, so you kind of have these associations. And for a lot of people who, who hold survey rights, that is their cultural heritage. Uh, the right to cut peat. And to an extent, you can kind of sympathise with this because during the recession, which was very deep in Ireland, people were cutting peat to warm their homes. Okay, so there's that kind of aspect. This big clash with peat extraction, what healthy peatlands do, in theory, which is mitigate climate change, and what is happening to the archaeology. Okay, and there's been some cases of this. You may have seen this, and so this is Call A1 again, but this is the, uh, the main late Bronze Age trackway. It made the press, I think, about a year ago now. Um, very rare example of a late Bronze Age trackway. It looks a bit like this when it was um, um, in its kind of pristine state. And it's gradually being destroyed by private commercial peat extraction with an absolutely minimal program of archaeological work. So this site has gone from looking like this, about 700 metres long of it, to essentially looking like this. Okay. So National Monument Service, um, I, I'm, watch what I say here, we're, um, um, didn't really get involved with this. So again, you know, we can ask the question, we come back to these questions of politics, you know, where is the government in all of this? And it's extremely problematic. So we're, having the, we're seeing the loss of archaeology on, on an enormous scale. We have uh, the social and cultural aspects associated with peat cutting, okay, for many people. And many people are entirely unaware of the heritage value of peatlands and the presence of, of the same many archaeological sites. So it's that kind of, it comes back to this education issue again. As I said earlier, the Irish government have been in trouble with the EU over their essential failure to enforce protection of peatlands. Why is that? Because for many uh, people who would be otherwise enforcing this on the ground, they live in those communities and they're part of those communities where people have, where people have these peat cutting rights. So it's very difficult to enforce this. Okay. The other part of that is this is not a political issue for most Irish politicians. It is not up the agenda. So protecting heritage is not on the agenda for most politicians. What is on the agenda is sticking up for people's peat cutting rights. Okay. So, just to finish off, that's, that's a real kind of a, a whistle-stop tour through all this. As you probably gather, there's many other issues coming out of this as well. Um, but it's extremely depressing, and it's a kind of rear guard action that we're trying to fight myself and, and a few other colleagues in Ireland. Um, but it's not held, helped by this kind of approach. We have recently had the National Peatland Strategy, Archaeology and environmental value is mentioned only once in that document. Okay. And not at all in the 32 actions that are detailed at the end of the strategy. So we don't have heritage on the agenda, really. Extremely problematic. And I can, I'm going to kind of finish there. Hopefully I've kind of touched on a few themes we've seen today already that have kind of come up to do with the relationship between how we value heritage, how we protect it, bigger kind of political issues, financial issues, and really big pictures to do with the protection of environments within the context of anthropogenic climate change. So you can maybe kind of see, and I've skirted around a few of the issues within this you, you may have picked up on, um, um, some of the broad issues to do particularly with why the programme of archaeological work has been such a failure. We can maybe talk about that later when the um, camera's not on. Um, but you can maybe see why I'm feeling a bit curmudgeonly at the moment. So uh, thank you for listening.